Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Diptarup Ghosh Dastidar and I am an assistant professor in the Amity School of Languages, Amity University, Chhattisgarh. And this is the second session of the explanation of Ulysses, the poem by Lord Alfred Tennyson. So in the previous video, in the previous session, what we did is we discussed the first part of the poem, which is the justification given by Ulysses um, about why he does not belong to Ithaca. He does not uh, belong there as a king, as a ruler, but instead he is a wanderer. He is a seafarer. He is a voyager. He is someone who has to travel far and wide. So we'll take that part ahead now and we'll move on to the second and third part of the poem and uh, so that we can finish it off, we can finish off the poem in this session itself. <coughs> in the earlier session, we also learned a few of the, um, you know, figures of speech. So we learned metaphor, we learned personification, we learned about transferred epithet, and we learned about alliteration and assonance, in which we did not find alliteration yet, but ringing plains or windy Troy, we found an assonance in this, the E sound, which comes a lot. So anyways, um, Moving on ahead from there, the second part of the poem, it starts with the first time that Ulysses addresses someone. He says, he points towards a particular direction and he says, this is my son, mine own Telemachus. Now see, there is this importance of saying mine own because he is a king and the person who will be king after him has to be his own successor. And therefore, he's uh, in a way trying to make his uh, people believe that this person, Telemachus, is actually worthy of being a king. And what kind of argument does he give for Telemachus being worthy of being a king? Well, if Telemachus is not the king, he cannot go because someone has to be the king. So he says, this is my son, my own Telemachus, to whom I leave the scepter and the isle. Now, what is the scepter? The scepter is basically a rod which is held by the kings. And the isle means the island. And well loved of me. So he loves Telemachus, obviously. It's, uh, Telemachus is his own son, although Telemachus is completely different from Ulysses in nature, in um, uh, the way he has been brought up. And we'll get to know about that. So, discerning to fulfill this labor, so Telemachus is supposed to fulfill this labor, this labor being the labor of serving his people, the labor of being a king. And um, what he says is that by slow prudence, prudence is using good wit, by slow prudence he will make mild a rugged people. So imagine, uh, I mean, remember the first line in which he says, the first five lines in which he says that a savage race that these people are, they are rugged people, they are savage people. And uh, in a way, the uh, Ulysses himself is also rugged, he's not mild, but Telemachus is mild. Now, another argument that Ulysses gives over here is that because I myself am not mild, how can I make my people mild? And uh, we need a little bit of temperation in order to have a good empire running. So I am not a ruler after all. I am I'm good at following orders. I'm good at doing battle. I'm good at uh, going and voyaging, but I'm not good at giving orders as such in the form of a ruler, which Telemachus might be because Telemachus is a mild person. He is brought up in a very mild manner and he has not seen battles. He has not seen any, uh, any of his friends die. So he says that um, he can make mild a rugged people and through soft degrees subdue them. So uh, the only way Ulysses knows how to act is by hard degrees. So taking swift and very strict, uh, you know, movements and very strict resolutions, which Telemachus need not make because Telemachus is a mild person. So subdue them to the useful and the good. So Telemachus can subdue the people in being useful, in being good. So that is why he wants Telemachus to be here. 
Most blameless is he, centered in the sphere of common duties. So he has been brought up doing the common duties, the household chores, the everyday life, right? And decent, he is decent enough not to fail in offices of tenderness. So wherever these nitty gritties of politics and these nitty gritties of tender, uh, uh, you know, behavior is necessary, Telemachus would be amazing in that. But I am not. I am rugged. I am <coughs> just not a ruler, basically. So here I is obviously Ulysses. So and pay meet adoration to my household gods. Now Ulysses, the Greek army, one of the things that the Greek and the um, uh, Spartan army did when they went to Troy is that they uh, broke down all the um, idols of the gods uh, that, that were there outside of the city of Troy. And uh, the Trojans believed that they will be punished for destroying the gods. So Ulysses is a person who is known not for paying, uh, you know, adoration and admiring the gods, but for breaking down temples. Whereas Telemachus, on the other hand, would be able to build temples and pay meet adoration to these gods, which is necessary in a good nation because people are brought together by religion. So in offices of tenderness and pay meet adoration to my household gods when I am gone. So what does he mean when I am gone? He means that when I am gone for my last journey. So I'm not dead, but I'm gone for my last journey. And this next part, he says a very crucial thing. And I think that this goes even today. He works his work, I mine. Everyone's work is cut out. Everyone's work is separate, but it's important. It's important to themselves. It's important for the entire uh, society. So everyone does their own work. And if they did not, the society would not run. That's the idea. So Ulysses is the voice of reason over here who says that, see, my abilities are not well suited. Don't make me well suited to become a king. But my abilities make me well suited to just go outside and um, travel. Well, because that's what I am. I am an Odysseus. I am a person who goes on Odysseys. This is where the second part ends, right? In the second part in which he addresses Telemachus, I hope it's been clear that why Telemachus is a better king than Ulysses will be. A better king than Ulysses. Now comes the third part in which he is now going to address his fellow sailors. What does he say? He say, there lies the port. He again points out at a dis uh, particular direction and sees, uh, says that there lies the port. The vessel puffs her sail. So what is a vessel? A vessel is basically a container, right? But you would say, why would he, s he suddenly call a container? Well, it is a container which contains a crew. So basically the vessel is a ship. A ship which goes out on the sea and this ship has sails so basically if let's say again pardon my artistic um, incompetence but if this is a ship then you would often find something like this you know this sail which actually takes the boat towards a particular direction so the boat is there on the harbor there lies the port the vessel puffs her sail which means the wind is coming in that is the ship is about to leave so he's already planned his leave so it's as if he is about to see dramatic moment of his life he is about to leave his kingdom and he says that my being here is not necessary i'm giving all my um, all my burden, all my responsibilities to my son, Telemachus, he'll take care of you. Let me just go on the ship and see, I won't go alone. I don't want to go alone. So what do I want? He says, my mariners. So he calls out to his mariners, right? Uh, the people who uh, traveled with him in the marine conditions. So what is a marine? Anything that has to do with the sea. So he says, my mariners, souls. He, um, now this is an example of um, synecdoche. Although not a very good example of synecdoche, but in a synecdoche, what happens is that you use a part of a person in order to explain or in order to, um, uh, you substitute it with the whole person. So basically when you say 20 rupees per head, 
you are not saying that it's 20 rupees for one head no 20 rupees per person but you don't say 20 rupees per person you say per head so the head is equal to the person so a part is equal to the whole and this is called synecdoche all hands on deck doesn't mean that all are meant to cut their hands and put them on the deck no all hands on deck means everyone come on board everyone come to the deck so it's synecdoche is like that so here um, he calls his mariners not as people but as souls so let us imagine souls our soul to be a part of ourselves our identity uh, not the body obviously but soul is a part of our identity and he often addresses this soul his entire address is not directly to the people but to the soul of people what is it that your heart wants does your heart want to stay in this place then stay if your heart wants to go away go away that is what Ulysses stands for um, be in the moment know yourself and then do what your heart wants so says my mariners souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me souls that have toiled they have worked hard toiled means worked hard and wrought they have been through thick and thin and thought with me whatever whenever i have been through difficult times they have thought the same way i think that ever with a frolic welcome took so ever with a frolic welcome now these people with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine what is frolic frolic means uh, playful so frolic is playful with a frolic that is a playful welcome uh, just because uh, Ulysses was leading these mariners these mariners with a in a very playful manner welcomed what what did they welcome they welcomed the thunder and the sunshine so here see what is happening the thunder is not literally the thunder the thunder is actually all the difficulty so it's um, a physical property which stands for something which is in the ideology so an abstraction that is difficulties has been given the physical manifestation of thunder whereas the abstraction of good times has been given the physical property of sunshine so sunshine is good times thunders is bad times so that with an ever frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts, free foreheads. So um, these people, they followed orders. They were always with each other and they opposed all kinds of other thoughts, thoughts that were imposed on them. They had free hearts. Their foreheads were free. They could do anything that they want on the seas because no one was there to tame them. Okay, now see what happens. He says that you and I are old. This idea of old age keeps returning. You see? Matched with an aged wife I meet and dole. My grey soul. Right? So these words, they all go back to the idea of old age and he says that uh, he emphasizes on the fact that now he is not the same Ulysses that he was once upon a time. He is the Ulysses of Dante who has grown old and who has withered and this time he has withered in his own kingdom. So his kingdom Ithaca is his own personal hell. It is his own personal inferno Ithaca. And he wants to get out of this inferno, go out on that last ride. And maybe that last ride will be uh, very similar to the ride of, um, you know, the, the Greeks have this, um, that in the mythology, there was this uh, boat keeper called Charon. I'll just write the name over here. Uh, this boat keeper Charon, who takes the souls of the dead people across the river Styx. So the river Styx is one of the four... Um, uh, rivers in hell so the four hellish rivers the biggest of them is Styx uh, Sharon is the boatman in Styx uh, so if you die and when you die your soul gets taken by Sharon to the other side and um, sometimes you've, you you might have heard that um, the Greek heroes and epic heroes they 
pay with a certain type of coin so that they can go to the other side and usually they come back with some adventure but anyways old you and i are old and he says that old age hath yet his honor and his toil so see this is where the optimism of ulysses comes in the positivity of U ulysses he says you and i are old so what he says that we are old but old age has its own honor old age has its own toil its own work death closes all but something ere the end wherever you find this word ere it it means before something ere the end there has to be something before the end death closes all but something ere the end some work of noble note something can be done some work which is noble can be done may yet be done a work which is becoming and see he's, he uses the negatives of the work he uses not unbecoming i'll just show how the negatives work so he says that some work can be done which is not unbecoming not unbecoming whom not unbecoming men and then he goes on but not unbecoming means becoming it's, it's a lot like negative negative becomes positive well something like that but yeah not unbecoming men is similar to becoming men so some work can be done which is good which can be uh, accepted as a work which men did what kind of men that strove with gods so in the battle of troy and i have told you that in the odyssey in iliad in these epics the gods and goddesses often came in the battle and they took sides and these were men who fought with gods okay so odysseus is a hero he's he's a champion he is not a mere soldier he has fought with gods he has fought with people who have fought with gods and who have displeased some gods pleased some other gods so um he says that uh, some work can be done which which becomes us which becomes uh, which is good which looks good on us who once fought gods there was a time we fought gods what are we today old men doesn't need to be we don't need to be old men right so he says that the lights begin to twinkle from the rocks so now he looks up and he sees the rocks that is the mountains and above the mountains he sees you no know, see like i told you a uh, word painting this is simply word painting over the rocks he can see the lights twinkling so what does he mean by lights twinkling the stars because at that time lights were stars twinkling lights were stars so the lights begin to twinkle from the rocks the long day wanes the slow moon climbs the deep moans round with many voices there is something very interesting in this line see he says the long day wanes wanes means it just doesn't want to end it goes on and on the slow moon climbs the moon is climbing slowly and the deep that is the sea moans round with many voices so the sea it seems has a lot of voices sometimes it is splashing sometimes it is making a roar sometimes it is making a bellow so the sea has its own voices and the deep means the sea okay now there's one very interesting way in which this sentence has been written and this goes back to how sonoras the poems of tennyson are sonority of the poems the sound is amazing uh, how do you get to know that see there is a reduction in the pace in which this is spoken so when you are saying let's say not unbecoming men that strove with gods the lights begin to twinkle from the rocks you're going fast but in this line you have to be slow the long day wanes the slow moon climbs now see between the long day wanes and uh, the slow moon climbs is there a colon yes the slow moon climbs and then there is another part uh, the deep moans round with uh, many voices but the long day wanes the slow moon climbs 
here is a colon but when you speak it it comes in the form of a gap interesting isn't it you don't have this gap in the other lines there lies the port the vessel puffs her sail just not too late to uh, seek a newer world this is my son my own telemachus straightforward lines but in this line the long day wanes the slow moon climbs this gap is called a caesura so usually it's a very common uh, device used in poetry uh, when you have uh, uh, a division between the two lines uh, bit in between one line which divides the two parts and there is a gap you when you while pronouncing it there is a gap it's called a sejura so it all comes under prosody so now you know sejura you know iambic pentameter why iambic you know trochaic you know blank verse you know heroic couplet why is it heroic because heroic poetry was written in that form uh, heroic poetry that is epics were written in iambic pentameter and uh, the couplet and you also know free verse so you know a little bit of prosody now good uh, if you have seen the other videos that is uh, you'll get to know and um, uh, moving on the long day wanes the slow moon climbs the deep moans round with many voices come my friends now he invites his friends that friends come it is not too late to seek a newer world it is there is still time we are so old but he is still so positive that there is still time you can still go and find a new world he says that it is not too late to seek a newer world push off and sitting well in order smite the sounding furrows sitting well in order so when you are in a boat again you sit in order right so there is an order maybe on the other side they are sitting right so there is an order in which they sit and uh, this is the order that he is talking about that push off and sitting well in order smite the sounding furrows what is a furrow a furrow is when a boat is moving let's say this way it leaves a mark on the sea all right you get a lot of waves over here so this is called a furrow okay and um it says that push off and sitting well in order smite the sounding furrows uh, beat the furrows beat with what oars so you will take an oar and you'll smite that is beat the sounding furrows the furrows which are making sounds so you see it's so beautiful i mean uh, the way in which he has written words they create a picture and it's this picture that creates poetry you see and i am starting to sweat again i think it's because i move so much that i sweat but anyways we'll move on um for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset like i've seen to sail beyond the sunset the sun is up the sun sets where does it set no one know uh, no one knows and he wants to go beyond that beyond where the sun sets so the other side and uh, the baths of all the western stars until i die so what does he mean by baths of all the western stars i'll just erase this part um western stars obviously the stars which you can see uh, while you try to look at the sun set so the sun rises in the east sets in the west the sun is over here now the sun is moving like this and in the times of ulysses well one thing which makes sense when he says sinking star or when he says go beyond the bound of utmost uh, of human knowledge uh, at that time no one knew about the shape of the earth at least uh, in the anglophone world all right at least in west according to western epistemology the greeks um, they came up with the idea of the earth being round but before that they had a common idea that the earth was flat flat earthers so the earth was flat according to them so in the east the sun rose and in the west it went away and then there were stars in the west and these stars they were like a, a bath so there was like a huge sea of stars so they believed that if they went towards this side they would fall into 
a bath that is a sea of stars so he wants to go beyond that he wants to go and jump into the bath of stars right i hope that bath of all the western stars is clear over here that for my purpose holds what i want to do my intent um my destiny well it could be intent purpose interesting purpose could be intent holds i want to or destiny i have to right so the purpose holds that um, I have to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. Now see, the gulfs um, are the various patches of sea which try to wash over ships. So there were a lot of ships which used to be drowned at that time. So it may be that the gulfs will wash us down. Now the point is even if they die on this journey, it will be worth it. This will be a death worth being mentioned, worth becoming another story. Ulysses is not made. Ulysses has not come to this earth in order to rule just like anyone else and then be forgotten. He has a fear of becoming forgotten. He doesn't want to be forgotten. So he wants to do something memorable till the end, till the last day of his life. This is where the optimism of Tennyson also comes in that even if, especially in the times of Tennyson, when science is making leaps and bounds, um, they are getting to know new things and whatever they knew before, old things, they are becoming obsolete. And so this urge to go beyond and to know more. This is extremely, um, you know, of the time in which Tennyson lived. So it may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the Happy Isles. I've talked about the Happy Isles in one of the videos. I'll, um, I'll, I'll link it to, uh, to this particular video. So we may touch the Happy Isles, which is a Greek equivalent for the Norse uh, Valhalla or Fokwanger, where um, basically, uh, you know, the Greeks... Um, uh, once they died, they went to the Happy Isles. And this is where he says, and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Uh, so Ulysses wants to go and see Achilles. And we have talked about how in 1833, this poem was written. And it was very soon after the death of his, this was an immediate response in a way to the death of his close friend, Arthur Henry Hallam. So anyways, he ends up by saying that though much is taken, although a lot has been taken, much abides, a lot is still left. And that is the note of optimism. It's like the famous glass of water, which is, is it half filled or is it half empty? So you would see that Ulysses goes with this group who says that although much of the life has been done, much of life has been done, much is still left and we still have one we still have one last voyage to go on so he says that uh, though much is taken much abides and though we are not we are not now the strength which in old days moved earth and heaven so once upon a time my mariners my fellow soldiers my fellow sailors you and i we used to move heaven and earth our stories moved heaven and earth we moved heaven and earth in all possible ways today we are old our bodies are not the same as they were once upon a time. So this goes on to the idea of Yubi Sunt. Uh, Yubi Sunt is a very famous Greek um, motif. Motif means something which keeps repeating, which means where have the days gone? So Yubi Sunt is basically a nostalgic motif. A motive that resides in nostalgia says that, okay, fine, we are not yet, uh, we are not those um, young versions of ourselves, but um, uh, that which we are, we are. And this is what makes Ulysses so great. He says that what we are, we are. It's all right. Um, if we are like this, we are like this. We cannot help that. So let's live with this. So this is a very survivalist kind of uh, an attitude, a very positive and optimistic kind of attitude that Ulysses has. Says that, um, what are we? 
So we are what we are. So what are this we? One equal temper of heroic hearts. One equal temper. You know temper? This temper is not rage. It is not angry. This temper is what you get in tempered steel. Right? So we are the same mold. So temper is mold. The figure or the shape. We are made from the same cloth. One equal temper and what are we made of? What is it that connects all of us? Heroic hearts. So you see the soul, the heart. He directly speaks to the heart, doesn't speak to the person. So he says one equal temper of heroic hearts who are made weak by time and fate. So see time and fate, Greek motifs again. Time and fate has done what made us weak physically. But has it made, uh, has it made our hearts weak? No, it should not. You have been my fellow supporter for a long time. Your body might be weak, but I don't want to see your body. I want to see your heart. He says, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find and not to yield. Amazing. The last line, one of the most iconic lines ever that made weak by time and fate, but we are strong in will and we will, what will the will do? To strive, to seek, to find and not to yield. So you see, you will strive. You will seek, search for it, then you will find and you will never give up, never yield. Do you see this upward movement? It's very similar to what uh, Julius Caesar would say that I came, I saw, I conquered. See, upward movement. This kind of movement with which this poem ends is called climax. This is another uh, figure of speech. Many good rhetoricians use this climax. So to strive, to seek, to find and to never yield and not to yield. So the poem doesn't end with a note of sorrow. It begins with a situation where he doesn't know what to do is really stressed but then it ends with such a high note it simply takes you to that place where you are given uh, you have been aroused and you feel like yes I want to go with you Ulysses I want to go with him on that one last journey so that uh, does it my friends that is it for the poem I hope that I have been able to clarify what the poem is about and uh, what the three sections are and how Tennyson has uh, talked about Ulysses and how the character of Ulysses and his doubts and his thoughts match with the Victorian era itself. Uh, now I'll just end this session with a very short note on how to prepare for um, uh, passage when it comes. So when you get a passage in exam, so I'll just write it down over here, that when you get a passage in exam, firstly what you do is number one, you try to figure out where, where in the text here the poem is the passage situated this is question number one which you answer question number two what is the context of the passage this is question number two so where in the text is the passage what is the context of the passage three what is the literal meaning of the passage. So what is the literal meaning that comes out? And number four, are there figures of speech or any analytical points that you want to offer? I think that if you can write these four in the proper order and most importantly, what I believe that in exams it helps a lot is Create a story, my friends. Create a story with your answer. Your answer should not be a note. Your answer should not be just something that you memorized. 
It is something that you have lived, that you have experienced. So when you write an answer, create a story and your answer will be amazing. With that said, I thank you all and I hope um, that you will find this interesting. One last thing, since this is given to you in the form of um, a YouTube video, I encourage you to you know post your questions if you have any doubts any questions you can post them in the comments section and i would be happy to answer those questions so thank you very much once again and i'll see you again in the next video